And we're live, yeah. I believe. Good evening, everybody. It is 6.02. We're a couple minutes late yeah. here. It was my fault. It's Wednesday. How's everyone doing out there? The first August outfit I, uh, that I picked today, Ray said I look like a preschool teacher. I don't have anything against a preschool teacher, but mm. she yeah. said that I look like her teacher who, I mean, she's, she's like in her 60s. Again, nothing wrong with teachers in their 60s. No, but absolutely I, I, not. No. I don't want to present as a, as a mm -hmm. teacher in her 60s, but anyway. So we're joining you a little more casual today. We're just uh, on our living room couch. So yes, we thought we'd try something a little bit different. Well, this is where it all time. began here. This, yeah. uh, our very first Facebook Live was on February 19th. <laughs> I know that date so well because mm -hmm. it was my birthday. That's right. <laughs> oh, and I see my aunt is watching. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hello Thanks to everyone. And we also have a studio audience here. Merrick and Allie are, are sitting on the steps. You guys can get cozy <laughs> in the kitchen. <laughs> yes, they, they popped in not realizing that since it's not, not Cousins Day, we were gonna do it here downstairs. Um, I don't think that's true. I think they popped in because they wanted to get their immigration questions answered. Yeah, you guys, if you have any questions, just throw them right at us because <laughs> we, we probably can <laughs> answer them, but we, if we can't, yeah, we get definitely Lisa. Definitely Hi, Lisa. Answered. Lisa, so many people on here tonight. Yeah, Thank you guys so really, much. really, cool. Okay. So we are, I'm John, this is Radlin. We're Gardner in Mendoza, and we do this every Wednesday night at six o'clock. Uh, give you some information about immigration, other legal issues. Um, the main thing we like to do is answer questions. And so we already had some questions come in for tonight's uh, Facebook live and we're gonna get to those in a little bit mostly dealing with DACA We've been getting a lot of questions about about DACA. So we're gonna address those um, in due course um, I am also going to let you know about the state court updates very few Radlin's gonna bring you up to date on USCIS updates. We're gonna do the questions we have regarding DACA I, of course, am gonna talk briefly about the Virginia driver privilege card that I talk about every week. Keep, keep the word out on that. And any questions that you have, uh, make sure that you post them up, get them in, and we will answer them, all right? Absolutely, and sorry, I, I was supposed to do the introduction today, but I was, okay. I was monitoring for questions. Yeah. Monitoring for questions. And just a, a reminder, we talk about the law here, we answer legal questions, but this is not legal advice okay so if you have a case and you have a legal question um, you can certainly listen to what we say here it's good information but don't rely on it and make a decision based on it because we are not your unless you're one of our clients of course we're not your attorneys and so what we're giving here is for educational purposes only and if you actually want a question answered and rely on it then you'll need to come see us as clients, okay? Yeah, and we would love that. Yeah, we would absolutely love that. I also just want to give a shout out to all of our people out there who like our Facebook page. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you guys tuning in. It means a lot. And when we started this journey, we really just wanted to get information out to the public because there's so many questions that need to be answered yeah. <laughs> that are unanswered. <laughs> and, and I know a lot of people have um, you know, just concerns and especially when COVID-19 hit, of course, there were so many questions and of course all the presidential proclamations and executive orders that we've been covering over the past several months. So we really appreciate your support. Please continue to like and share our page yeah. and um, that way you can get updates, continue to get updates. All right, these have not been normal times and so we've been trying to just keep everyone informed the best that we can about everything going on. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. So, you do you want to start with a quick uh, state court update? Do yes. not let your computer fall off of that ledge. No, I won't. This is I'm 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 paperless now. <laughs> I'm on my laptop. <laughs> this uh, is weird. Yeah, John and, always and, prints out like and, seven, and seventy-five for, pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and for those, yeah, for those who know me, uh, I'm the uh, you know one of the last people that's still clutching tightly to my paper, <laughs> but um, I'm on a laptop tonight, so it's a first for everything. But in any event, um, so here's a reminder about what's going on with the state courts. <clears throat> no change from the last few weeks. 
Uh, they're basically, USCIS is a different story, but the state courts, they're back up and running. Okay, everything there is pretty much normal. I will remind you to bring a mask, all right? Most of the courthouses are asking questions when you come in, whether you have any symptoms, if you've traveled abroad in the last 14 days. Some of them are doing, um, taking your temperature. Some have machines to take a temperature, temperature scan, but all of them are requiring that you have a mask. So if you go to state court, if you have a case coming up and you kind of blew it off for a while because you figured, wow, well, everything's closed anyway, not the case anymore, everything is open, find your paperwork, find your mask, and make sure you're there so you don't have any more trouble. All right? All right. Oh, and there's my mom signing on. Hi, mama. <laughs> That's I am not. That I'm, is. That's no, gonna not, fall. I'm that not, is gonna fall. gonna fall. Why don't you just put it in your lap? It's yeah, a laptop. I'm moving the laptop into my lap. <laughs> wife That's is concerned. Is. Wife is concerned. I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm just wifing right now. I'm sorry. I'm wiping, wiping you on. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's okay. I just, I can just see it going down. But um, all right. So, all right, what so a, that, that's the state court updates. How about USCIS? Yes. Let me just go through some updates from last week. The filing fee increases on October 2, 2020. So the filing fees are going to go up for those who are applying for pretty much everything they're going up. Um, if you want a specific form that, and you want the fee for that, you can shoot us a message and I'll answer that question for you and send you the list. But things like naturalization going up significantly by 83%. Um, I believe the, the marriage adjustment forms, all of the forms that are um, for marriage adjustments, which are currently 1,760, I believe they're going up to 2,850. I deleted my notes from last week, but if my memory serves me correctly. So they are going up significantly for many of the applications. So you all definitely want to make sure you get things in order to file before October 2nd of this year. Filing fees are going up. Don't say we didn't warn you, right? Uh, and you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons people aren't filing their naturalization applications, and one of the big reasons that we have found, and I'm I'm speaking anecdotally from from just 20 years of practice, is because of procrastination. So please don't procrastinate on your N-400. If you know that it's been sitting on your nightstand for you know seven years, and you've really been meaning to get to it, now is the time. It's currently um, seven. $125 to apply for it and uh, I don't have the exact amount as to what it's going up to I'll, I will have that by the end of this live feed but it's going up by 83% so whatever whatever that is mm -hmm. it's, it's going to 1170 I yeah. just remembered it 1170 so that's pretty significant it is and, and also just remember that uh, after that I have no doubt they'll go up again at some point down the road I mean when you're talking about the government, I've been doing this for 20 years, fees only go up, they never go down, so. That's true, that's a really <laughs> good point. Yeah, it and, just gets uh, worse and worse. You know, worse. one of my favorite clients, she waited uh, 30 years to file her N-400 application, so um, I wasn't a lawyer, I was a lawyer at the very end of that process. My mom, calling you out mom, <laughs> she was a lawful permanent resident of the United States for 30 years, she finally, got time to do it when our grocery store had a fire for those of you who may know my family and shopped at our family's grocery store when we had a fire it totally closed down she was not working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week any longer she had the time to to do her n-400 application so um, don't be like my mom go ahead and apply for that when you can if you're eligible yeah, if you are waiting right. waiting it really will cost you this time in, in dollars yes <laughs> and maybe even more than just dollars but we're not going to get into that discussion so the public charge rule those forms i'm just suffice to say right now the public charge rule that we have been talking about for months and months now um, it is not required at this time due to uh, a lawsuit which um, enjoined which stops uh, USCIS from from asking for this while we're in a period of um, you know this national health 
emergency. So it's just, it's not required right now and it's, it's going, it's, that's awesome. Um, but we are asking our clients to still get all the documents to prepare for it in the event that it changes again and it is required. So this applies to those who are, uh, who are applying for adjustment of status and also consular processing from abroad the State Department forms um, 5540 and then the USCIS form I-944, not currently required for your filings. As we mentioned for the past couple of weeks now, the future of DACA, and we're gonna talk a lot about DACA this evening, is under a 60 to 100 day review. So that's, yeah. we're two weeks into that review yep. now, right? Yep. And you know, we've had some FAQs and some frequently asked questions about DACA, so we're gonna to try to address those this evening, along with your questions, so please put them in the comments. I'm, I'm watching for them. Um, and we are helping people with new filings for DACA, even though USCIS is not accepting them, primarily because once they do, a pursuant to you know the Supreme Court, which I think they should be mm -hmm. accepting the new applications right now, they're not, but they should. They they should be. Um, there's so much to get together in order to prove that you're eligible for DACA, primarily that you've continuously resided in the United States since June 15th, 2007. So you know, doing the math, that's 13 years. That's a lot of documentation. Um, got Lisa here, immigration paralegal for so many years. We often have immig other immigration attorneys watching our colleagues. They know that's a lot of documentation to get together. Yeah. And um, you know, when we say we need 13 years of something, we need probably over 1,500 pages of, of documentation. So it's a lot and it's a lot um, for our clients to do. So if you're in that boat and you're in that category and you think, hey, I, I might be eligible for uh, a new filing of DACA, please reach out to us. Our phone number at the office is 757-464-9224 and you can also um, reach us through Messenger, Facebook Messenger, and an email, info at gmlaw.net. And I just want to say hello to everyone. I'm super excited to see that people are joining us. And uh, I'm, I'm Radley Mendoza, and this is my law partner and husband, John Gardner. We're attorneys at Gardner Mendoza Immigration Law Firm. And we are stoked that you're here. So please put your comments in yep. and qu any questions that you have, because that's why we're actually here. All this other stuff that I'm talking about is really just kind of like filler. <laughs> you all are the star of the show. Well, but we it hope still that people important. will come if they you know, get their questions answered. That's, that's really the main thing, if we can. And we, you know, we've already gotten some, but we're going to get to those in a little bit. I have also been saying this for quite some time now, um, <clears throat> since March, actually. If you have filed an application with USCIS, that's your immigration service um, that handles the benefits, for you and USCIS has sent you a request for evidence or maybe you went to your N-400 interview and you got an N-14 um, notice of a continuance because the officer wanted more documentation and for the N-14s you're getting only 30 days for a request for evidence typically the um, service is going to give you 87 days to answer that if you got a notification like that and this also includes notice of intents to deny NOIDs um, uh, as well as N336s, appeals, and 400 appeals. If you got one between the time periods of March 1st, 2020 until in the future here, September 11th, 2020, then you have an additional 60 days to answer that, let's say, request for evidence um, on top of the date uh, that has already been given to you. So that has been hugely helpful for us and for our clients. I answered one, you know, on the 59th day on Friday. That case got approved. Yay, can we, can we get yes, it? Yes, that was fantastic. <laughs> it was a request for evidence. That was and, awesome. And um, it was one of those kitchen sink requests for evidences. Is that right? Requests for requests, yeah. requests for evidence. That's right. Sorry, thank you. See, yeah. John was an English major. I was only an English minor, so. I'm constantly butchering the, the grammar. Hey, I was here. impressed when you said suffice to say, because everybody always says suffice it to say, but it's not suffice it to say, it's just <laughs> suffice to say. Really? Yeah. Did, did I not say it? I feel no. like I would have been the one no, to you, say it. You nailed it. All right. So it's when you get that request for evidence, 
it's not going to say, oh, by the way, you know, you have an additional 60 days on top of this date that we've just given you. It's not going to say that at all. So again, it's, it's, it's hugely helpful. It's helpful for us. It's helpful for our clients. I just want you all to know that you have extra time. If you have any questions about that, because it can be confusing as to when the deadline is, um, I use a date calculator or our office uses a date calculator, the whole team, um, you know, just, just send us a message. We'd be happy to help you calculate when that is do all right uh, for those who are wondering about their immigration court date so you've got immigration court you've been given a date you don't know if that's still going to happen I'm, I just want to give you a number that you can call and put in your a alien number your a number it's 1-800-898-7180 it is the e EOIR information number and you can put your a number in there and um, find out when your court hearing is going to be scheduled. So, you know, one of our clients recently got a notice to appear in immigration court, and on that notice to appear, the NTA, the there was a date that was given, and you know, my team and I was like, "There's no way that that date is the the correct date." Um, it was, you know, a month after. He, he, he got the NTA knowing that that we you know knowing that the courts are completely backlogged that was just not possible so we've been calling the 1-800 EOIR number the 1-800-898-7180 to find out you know when is our clients true court date so we find out uh, today that it's in it's in the year 2023 <laughs> so we knew that it was not gonna be you know at the end of this month it's actually gonna be in 2023 because that's how backlogged uh, these cases are so um, call that number if you can't figure it out give us a call let us know we'll we'll help you out with that so let's see the new stuff that I have going on for today is that it looks like um, the USCIS furloughs are going to go forward on August 30th and um, the negotiations in the relief package were stalled and, and so therefore it looks like those furloughs are going to go forward. So 13,400 people, um, U.S. citizens, you have to be a U.S. citizen to work for the federal government. That's another perk of being a naturalized U.S. citizen or, you know, of course, born in the United States. Um, so 13,400 U.S. citizens, U.S. CIS workers are going to be furloughed because we couldn't. Congress couldn't figure it out for them. No. <laughs> um, this is going to be hugely, no there. hugely disruptive to your immigration case, our immigration cases, or of course our clients' immigration cases, I'm very disappointed. Um, not, and again, because of the disruption, of course I'm disappointed for my clients, but um, as I've mentioned before, we have, uh, you know, we have colleagues that we've worked for for 20 years at the immigration office, they're friends of mine, and, and they're gonna be losing their jobs. Um, so hopefully not for more than 30 days, but um, we'll see what happens. But that's yeah. bad. That's bad news. Let's see here. Do, do you want to say anything? Regard? Do you want to just? No, we're we're not doing that. For yeah, now. you're you're good for now, and then when we get to. I was these, just trying to take these, a break. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can take a break. Because I don't think we have any questions yet, do we? No, we we don't. No? Well, other than the ones that were submitted before we started. No questions in the we, in the live feed. I can say hi though to my aunt, who's joining us. My aunt Jill from South Florida. Hi, Jill. Hi, Jill. Thanks for joining us. And all of our friends and family mm -hmm. here and all the people who are here watching, but especially our friends and family. They, yeah. I don't think they need any immigration help, do they? Nope. They're just here to support us and we appreciate that. Yeah, we do appreciate that. <laughs> all right, so we are members of American Immigration Lawyers Association. And if you don't have an immigration lawyer, that is one of the things that you should look to to make sure that your whatever immigration attorney that you pick is a member of the American Immigration Lawyer Association. Yeah, it's a great group. Uh, lots of information that comes out of the group every every single day. And today we had a town hall meeting with um, about 100 attorneys in the area of Baltimore, Washington D.C., the no Northern Virginia area, and Norfolk. And that's where the three USCIS field offices are for, for our area, generally speaking. So there are about 100 attorneys, and we had several liaison um, members there. I'm a liaison member, and a couple of other of my colleagues are as well for the Norfolk office. 
I don't know why we need three, but you know, we need, we have three. <laughs> There's a lot of information that, that comes There's up. There's a lot of information. Um, that is so true. we were basically just discussing the different things that are happening around in, in those different field offices. And it's pretty, it's pretty much standard for all three offices. As I've said before, masks are required. There are gonna be the plastic panels up separating the clients from the officer. Um, there is an option for lawyers to appear telephonically if you know, the clients don't feel comfortable with the attorney sitting next to them um, because there is not gonna be that six foot distance. And all three offices are starting to get green card interview notices for the end of this month, just like we are here in Norfolk. So. That is just generally what's happening, and it, it sounds like things are kind of moving pretty, just getting back to, a little bit back to normal. Other than the fact that, and I heard this for Baltimore, that they're doing one adjustment of status, one green card interview per day. Okay? Can we like speed that up a little bit? I mean, you That's can, you can be, maybe do, I, it, I don't know, maybe, be a long maybe I misunderstood, but. Yeah. So that's what I heard did too. you hear that too? Mm -hmm. uh, one, anyway, all right, so. And then maybe when the, the workers are furloughed or the staff is furloughed, there'll be like half of one per day. Like you, anyway, I'm not even gonna start. I already started. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's, that is all for USCIS updates. And let's see here, what does that say, one? Yes, yes, yes Lisa, that's correct. That's in Baltimore. I don't, I'll have to find out what's happening in, in Norfolk, but I'm going to say that Norfolk is, is going to be more efficient than that, but I don't know. We'll see. I've got, like I said, I've got an interview at the end of the month on the 28th. Furloughs are happening on the 30th. I'm so happy that's happening on the 28th and not the 30th, but I think people are still not going to be in the best mood ever. Um, I wouldn't be in a great mood if I knew I was going to get furloughed, but still keeping fingers crossed that, that something gets worked out and uh, they get the funding that they need. Yes, Lisa, that's a good question. Lisa says, what about interviews scheduled for after August 30th? I think that everybody's just kind of taking it day by day. We, I'm trying to think if we have any interviews. I think we have some interviews scheduled for after the, the 28th of August. So still, still planning on, on doing those, but they, they could get canceled. I don't know, but Baltimore was also talking about getting interviews canceled mm -hmm. as well. So we'll keep you posted. We will be doing these weekly, except next week. We're going to be on vacation next week. Right. We will not be here next Wednesday. I know you guys are going to miss us terribly. We're going to miss you. <laughs> I know you're going to, I know you're going to survive though. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yes. We are going to try to have an unplugged uh, vacation. We'll see. Yeah. If you see us on Wednesday, then you know. We're terrible we, yeah, we... at, at taking time off. <laughs> All right. It's 50 50 at this point. It's 50. Let's be no, it's no, 50 /50. no. It's, it's 70 30. That's right. <laughs> We're unplugging. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So um, those are the updates. Anything else to update? No, I don't think so. I think those okay. are the updates for now. And we're going to just go through some DACA Q&A that we've received. Yeah, so let's get into DACA. We wanted to talk about this tonight because, again, we're um, it's obviously something that's percolating in the community because we're seeing a lot of questions from people about it. Um, and, it and just a reminder, DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. These are folks who have their status um, because of the fact that they were uh, entered the United States and they were minors at the time and, and Radlin already went through what all the requirements are to apply for that um, but what we're hearing a lot from right now are folks and I think it's because well I know it's because DACA has been in flux uh, because of some of the changes with the administration and the Supreme Court's ruling and so on and so forth and so we're getting questions from folks who are renewing DACA and they're trying to figure out what's going on with that so one of the questions was very straightforward. The question was, when should I renew my DACA? You want me to that? answer that question? Yeah. I've been doing all the talking nah, for the past is, five minutes. Nope. This is all you. You're going you're gonna to ask so all these questions. So you should renew your DACA 150 days prior to its expiration. I wouldn't file it any sooner than 150 days before it expires, but um, it's as close to that as possible. 
you know, 149 days, 148, 147, you get the picture. Definitely within 120 days of it expiring. So if you can't hit that 150, try for the 120, but try to do it as, as, as soon as possible. And what if it already expires? What if you miss it? And... Yeah, this is, this is um, it, let me just say this about it. Your DACA has expired. Let's say it's expired for two months, you were too busy, you forgot to, to, expi uh, to renew it and uh, you, you want to renew it now. I'm saying that you can, we, we do those. We, we file the renewal, it hasn't been a problem for us. Um, I, I had to look to some previous memos in order to find you know, some language on this, but it looks like if it's been expired for more than a year, then you're not gonna be able to renew it. So number one, just don't let it lapse, okay? It, I shouldn't even said that you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a lot of people let it lapse. We've had some clients that let it lapse for. Folks don't for, want to let it lapse. That's just just don't let it let it lapse. <laughs> but um, if you do, come talk to us, and we we should be able to file it and and get get it renewed for you. But I my my advice is to not 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 let it lapse. Right. Okay. One of the other FAQs um, that we've had is just. If something bad happens, you know, to a DACA applicant, like um, they've committed a crime, should I, did I phrase that correctly? Yeah, I mean, yeah. if they, if they, if if something bad happens in the <laughs> sense that they've been charged yeah. with a crime, and and some of the common ones that um, we've seen, and specific ones that have been asked about, have been assault and battery, possession of marijuana, uh, theft, yeah, DUI. I mean, if, look, somebody who has DACA, they're they're people just like everyone else and uh, they're moving in around and are they're moving around in society and doing the things that all the rest of us are and so obviously there are going to be unfortunate situations where um, somebody who has DACA finds themselves in a situation where maybe they have been charged with possession of marijuana maybe they got a DUI uh, maybe they had um, some trouble at home and have a domestic assault and battery charge and again these are just charges not even convictions just yeah. they've been charged with these things um, and that's you know that's not crazy or unheard of for any of us so it's a pretty typical typical possibility um, but it really creates a problem potentially and a lot of legal questions for those folks because what we see fairly often now are folks what we've been seeing are folks that have a renewal of their DACA coming up, um, but they have some sort of a charge that is pending. And then the question becomes, gosh, what do I do? Uh, I'm supposed to, you know, we just told you a few minutes ago that you should, you should renew 150 days prior, but I have this DUI charge that's pending, or I have this assault and battery charge, or marijuana possession, or whatever it is, and so what should I do? Should I go ahead and file it now? Should I try to wait till the case is over? Um, if I do file it now while the case is pending, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna get rejected? Is it, are they gonna renew it anyway? Are they gonna ask me for a, more information about the case? Um, and so these are all the questions that swirl around with these cases. And there are no real simple, easy answers. They're, it's really a case-by-case -case situation. Every single case is gonna depend on various factors. So there are no real bright line rules that we can give you a black and white other than a few that we can kind of talk about. And one is that you will be barred from renewing your DACA app, um, if you have a charge that is considered a significant misdemeanor or if you have convictions for three or more non-significant misdemeanors. So then the question obviously becomes, well, what, what's a significant misdemeanor and what's a non-significant misdemeanor? And uh, even beyond that, uh, what if I have a significant misdemeanor, uh, but the case was taken under advisement and I'm gonna go back in a year from now and maybe it'll be dismissed at that time? Or what if some of my non-significant misdemeanors were charges that were ultimately dismissed pursuant to a finding under advisement. Do those count as convictions or do they not count as convictions? Um, 
So we, we would have to analyze your case, obviously, very carefully, because it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. But in a nutshell, the, um, the significant misdemeanors are going to be cases that in federal law are defined um, by a maximum term of imprisonment is one year or less, but greater than five days. Okay, so you take a state court case, and the question is, is there a term of imprisonment between five years, but not more than eight, uh, five days, excuse me, but not more than one year, then it's possibly a significant misdemeanor, all right? Here are six that are absolutely considered significant misdemeanors. One is domestic assault and battery. One is sexual abuse or exploitation. One is burglary. One is unlawful possession or use of a firearm. One is drug distribution or trafficking. And one is driving under the influence. So if you have one of those six charges, then you almost definitely have a significant misdemeanor and that's going to potentially be a problem we would have to look at what were the actual facts of the case all right um i say it's case by case because it's it, you know domestic assault and battery is a perfect example you know if you have a domestic assault and battery charge that's pending um if you could somehow convert that to just a simple assault and battery but take the family part out of it then potentially not a problem, okay? So that's that's why you definitely need to see an attorney to see what the options are, not just an immigration lawyer, but a criminal defense lawyer, and to talk to your criminal defense lawyer about the fact that you have DACA. I mean, it's absolutely critical. If you've got a charge that's pending, um, you need to make sure that your criminal defense attorney knows that you have DACA, because that's a huge part of your case. All right. Yeah, and I, I will say a few months ago, we had a, a client retain us and they fired their attorney. And the attorney basically said, you know, your immigration status has nothing to do with this criminal charge. Right. And I don't know where this person's been for the past uh, 10 years. <laughs> when did Padilla yeah. come out? I don't know. Yeah, when. It, was, it hasn't been 10 years, but... I mean, this criminal defense attorney has an absolute duty to know what his client's immigration status is and what a criminal conviction would do to that person's criminal, I'm sorry, immigration status. And so this is something that John and I have been mm -hmm. really, it's, it, it is really just sort of the uh, connection between what both of us do. You know, John does a lot of criminal defense of um, non-U.S. citizens, you know, I do the immigration work, but we've, we really, really, really cannot emphasize enough how important it is to get this just analyzed. I mean, there are a lot of DAPA clinics out there, okay, and, you know, we do naturalization clinics every year, and they're awesome, they're amazing, they're super helpful, but even we have, you know, a, a criminal defense attorneys on call or, or immigration attorneys who know about the criminal consequences, um, the immigration consequences of a criminal conviction. And, and I know that DACA, DACA workshops and, and they also do as well, but you, you might want to get a second opinion because it's, it's, this is your life, right? I mean, this benefit really keeps you in the United States without having to look over your shoulder like maybe you've done for half of your life. Um, and it, it's so important and I just can't em emphasize that enough. And I know our DACA applicants take their status very seriously and their benefit very seriously. And I just don't want people to think, okay, well, I'm gonna just get my DACA renewed and I have this whatever, marijuana, marijuana possession charge um, that I'm about to plead you know, pay the ticket or whatever it is now, mm -hmm. um, it, it can absolutely impact even though it's something s seemingly small. That's not right. a big deal to most criminal, to, to some criminal defense attorneys out there who don't know about what the issues are. Yeah, and that's the danger is that, um, is being lulled into the, the thinking that because the penalty is not very severe in the state court, yeah that it must not be very severe for my immigration case either. And that is absolutely not the case. There's no connection at all. Um, well, 
there's some connection, I suppose. I mean, for example, if you uh, have a misdemeanor that we discussed earlier that's not one of the six that I just named, but you served 90 days or more up in jail, so you actually were in jail for 90 days or more, all right, that would also be considered a significant misdemeanor. You might think to yourself, gosh, I just served, you know, 100 days in jail. This must be pretty serious. But for other things like, you know, domestic assault and battery, that's a perfect example. Not that, not that domestic assault and battery is not serious. It's just that, you know, couples get in fights. If you go down to the Norfolk or Virginia Beach Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court or any of them for that matter, you're going to see a ton of these cases on the docket all the time. I mean, it's really common, all right? And it's the way that they're adjudicated is typically not to try to like really hammer uh, somebody, the defendant, but more to, you know, say, okay, we're gonna help this couple stay together. We want you to do some anger management classes. We're gonna take it under advisement. You come back here and, you know, if everything has gone well, then we'll, we'll reevaluate it reevaluate it at that point. And that's not a bad approach. I'm all for that. It's just that um, that might also give you the false impression that, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal, but it's, it could be absolutely the kiss of death for your, for your immigration case, okay? Especially DACA. So, because um, that's what we're talking about tonight. So that's, that's our message is that if you have DACA and you have a criminal charge pending of any kind, you really, really, really should seek legal counsel about the matter to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing, okay, in terms of how you're going to approach the criminal case as well as how you're going to proceed with your uh, DACA application. Which brings me to the next question. If you do have one of these cases pending, what do you do? Do you go ahead and file it while it's pending or should you try to wait till the case is over? thoughts on that I have some thoughts on it I'm, I'm gonna just answer again very generally and not for anyone's specific case so please don't be taking notes because you have something like this you have to give us a call if you if you feel like gosh I fall under this category and this is me um, I just just kind of thinking about the timing that we've got going on right now okay up until September 11th of 2020 any request for evidence that we receive, we can tack on an additional 60 days. So 87 days plus 60 is 147 days, right? And we talked about that. So the question is, and again, it's, it's calculation, it's strategy. The question is, um, when I file my DACA, is 147 days enough time in order for this case to be, my criminal case to be over and done with? So when, USCIS asked for a certified disposition of my case, which they are going to ask for. I mean, I, you know, John, John and I were talking earlier, and he said, hey, well, what if it's a, a simple assault and battery, which is not, does not, fall, and it's the only thing, and it does not fall under the, the significant misdemeanor. Can't we just show and argue that it's just a simple assault and battery, and even though he's, they have been charged with it, it's not going to impact DACA anyway. Yeah, that would seem like a reasonable thing to do, but again, being in, uh, in practice for 20 years, that's just not what's gonna happen. And they're gonna wanna see that certified disposition before approving this case, even if ultimately it does not impact the end result of approving that case. So I am still, just generally speaking again, and we have to look at these cases on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, we've spent tons of time just looking at our, our cases with DACA um, where these issues come up about whether to file it, when to file it, what should we do. And we talk about this with the two of us and with our other attorneys, Sarah Lawler and Domini, and, um, and we, we have conversations and discussions about it and we do research about it. It's just not something that we can say, yes, broadly, this is what we should do. It's definitely on a case-by-case -case basis. But I'm thinking about because we have these extra 60 days that do you think that a case uh, in, in, let's say, Virginia Beach General District Court will be done 
in 140 days, seven days, if they, you know, that's the time that we have. I do. I do. Yeah. Um, Unless it gets locked down again, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that, that's obviously the, the huge wild card here, but um, as long as things continue to operate the way that they have been, then yes, that's completely a reasonable amount of time for a case to be concluded. Right, and then... And that's the best case scenario, I think, is to, um, if possible, to have a case resolved, and hopefully in a way that is going to be good for your DACA, so that when you do submit it, you can include the uh, certified disposition of what happened in the case. Right, yes, if, if you have that time. But if your DACA is about to expire, you know you have a court date coming up, right. which is, you know further out into the future than when you have to file that DACA application. That's the issue. Right. So. Do it, you apply and include the, maybe the, the arrest warrant and the summons? Um, you, if you, that's going to come back, you're going to get an RFP, right? A request for evidence. I think so. That. Yeah. Um, and so, but at least maybe that buys you some time. Anyway. We, we're going around and around yeah, here. Yeah, we really are. What we're really, <laughs> <laughs> what we're really um, trying to emphasize here, and hopefully it's getting through, is that if you have DACA, or really any criminal charge for that matter, right? We're, we're talking about DACA tonight, but if you are a non-U.S. citizen and you have a criminal charge, you really need to make sure that you consult with an immigration lawyer, that you tell your criminal defense that you have your criminal defense lawyer consult with an immigration lawyer and get the right information. And this is not going way above and beyond. This is absolutely necessary and it's required under Padilla anyway. I mean, the US Supreme Court was very clear that prosecutors have to take immigration consequences into consideration if they're presented. Criminal defense lawyers have a duty to inquire about them and to, they don't have to know the answers, but they certainly have to exercise due diligence to find out the answers from someone who does know the answers. Uh, and judges also are required to take this into consideration. The collateral consequences, the immigration consequences of a criminal conviction on somebody have to be taken into consideration by a judge if they are presented by counsel. Okay, so make sure, <laughs> make sure that, you, that you let your lawyer know, okay? Yes. It's, it's crucial. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this kind of took a turn for uh, immigration consequences of criminal convictions. And maybe we should do one that's yeah. just all, all about that. I mean, Well, that's always been out there. It's just that we have yeah. really seen a lot with DACA right now because... DACA is hot right now. I mean, there's a lot of questions. There's and, a lot going and, uh, on with it. Yeah. And so that's the context where we're seeing all this. But anyway, that's anything else that we want to say about that? No, I think that right. we've we've covered it. Uh, well, you know, I want to just briefly mention, and I'll read a couple of points here, this uh, July 28, 2020 memo, where Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf announced that in response to the Supreme Court's decision, the Department of Homeland Security will take action to thoughtfully consider the future of the DACA policy, which is that 60 to 100 day right. period of time including whether to fully rescind the program. So this is just language from July 28, 2020. Um, and it goes on to say, in the interim and to address serious concerns with the policy, the Department of Homeland Security will make the following changes to DACA immediately. Number one, uh, reject all initial requests for DACA and associated applications for employment authorization documents. So that's the EAD. I mean, DACA is great, but what we really want is to get the EAD, right? The work permit, the, the right to work, go get the driver's license, you know, live just a, a normal life like these, these uh, DACA applicants should be. Um, to reject new and pending requests for advanced parole absent exceptional circumstances. Uh, no advanced parole right now. I mean, an advanced parole is, is to allow DACA applicants to leave the country and come back in. So that's just not happening right now. And exceptional circumstances, I mean, I don't know what what they they would be at this point but i wouldn't recommend even trying it if you feel either. like you have an exceptional circumstance you know feel free to reach out of course and we'll take a look at it um, and limit the period of renewed deferred action granted pursuant to the DACA policy after the issuance of this memorandum to one year so we went down from two to one so you know i'm again i'm sure that the DACA applicants out there are 
very concerned, especially mm -hmm. with this messaging and have a lot of uncertainty. And uh, I, I feel for the DACA applicants and all the people who are fi finding themselves in this situation and not knowing what, what's going to happen. But, you know, it's easy again, it's easy for me to say, you know, we have to take it day by day and just, you know, what can we do at this point? I, I know there's, there's a lot of advocacy out there for DACA and uh, we will continue to keep you posted. And if anything changes, either good or bad, we'll, we'll be here to let you know for sure. Absolutely. I think that's all we have yeah. regarding the DACA. Um, I know you wanted to mention yeah. again the- If anyone has any questions that you didn't get posted tonight or you think of after the fact, you know, please send them to us and we will, we will be in touch with you. Okay. Absolutely. And then also I've, I've noticed a trend here a little bit where we get off of Facebook Live yeah. and we get a bunch of questions via Messenger for people who don't feel comfortable um, asking a question live and in the comments and I totally understand that. So yeah. we are monitoring our messenger questions, you know, usually 30 minutes to an hour and I'm asked, answering, I'm answering the, we are answering the question. So if you'd prefer to send it that way, feel free. We're here. We have, we have, we have immigration life. I was going to say, we don't have, we have no life. We, we do have a life and it's to answer those questions. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Ho hopefully Merrick and Allie and Ray are listening and they, yeah. they go home and they thank their parents for uh, mm -hmm. for having them here, birthing them in the United States of America mm -hmm. so they don't have to deal with all of this. You right. guys are lucky. You should be grateful. You should thank your parents. It's all Okay, <laughs> so on a, on a last note, the last thing I want to mention, which I do every week, is uh, the... Beginning on January 1st, 2021, there will be a driving privilege card available in Virginia, which will basically be just like a driver's license in the sense that it will allow you to legally drive in the Commonwealth of Virginia. All you'll have to be, all you have to do to get it is be able to pass the driving test, uh, meet the insurance requirements in the state, and show that you had income from Virginia sources reported on a tax return within the 12 months prior to your applying for the driving card, okay? So if you know anyone who will benefit from that, who you think may benefit from it, please let them know. And if they have questions about it, they can contact us or go onto our website or Facebook page. We have information posted about it there, but this is absolutely wonderful because I know a lot of folks who really need to drive for work and for various reasons cannot get a Virginia driver's license. And this will solve that because the only three requirements, again, income in Virginia reported on tax returns, you have insurance and you can pass the test. You don't have to do anything. It involves immigration. All right. You don't have to show any special presence in the United States or anything like that or in Virginia. Okay. So make sure to let people know that. Okay. Yes, we do appreciate it. Do appreciate again, I'm going to do our phone number real quick again for those who still use the phone. <laughs> and that's a lot. A lot I of our clients phone. still call. 757-464-9224. Yeah. If you have any follow-up questions about anything that we've talked about here, we have instructed our team to you know, let, let, let you all talk to us and, and ask about the, the topics covered here to our Facebook Live audience only, right? Mm -hmm. And you could also shoot us a message through Messenger and info at gmlaw.net through email. Info, I-N-F-O, at gmlaw.net. Shout out to our old roomie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're doing well. Ayana is in Richmond now at VCU, so you should go take care of her, okay? Go take care of little cousin. And, and regarding that Virginia driving privilege card, real quick, you just you don't want to wait till to January to start trying to find all this stuff. Yeah. You need... It's, like so much with immigration, um, this is the same in the sense that you want to try to get all this stuff together now, okay? And if, that way if you're missing something or something's confusing or you have to do something for something, you can have it all ready so that when January rolls around, you ring in the new year and then you go get your driving privilege card and you've got all your, your uh, what, ducks in a row. Is that what they, yeah, ducks in a row. <laughs> all your ducks in a row, all right? <laughs> All right. Well, that was a lot that we covered tonight yes. for 51 uh, minutes. Uh, it was uh, awesome. Can I get a high five? Yeah. Anyway, guys, 
thank you so much. We are going to be on vacation next Wednesday. Yep, next Wednesday. We, we can't tell here. you where we're going because it's a secret location. Yeah, secret. <laughs> All right, anyway. We really appreciate you guys. Yeah, we do. Two thumbs up for the win. Yep, two thumbs up for the win. If you have any questions, let us know, and we will be monitoring everything for several hours tonight after we sign off. So if you want to send us a question through Messenger, please do, okay? We hope we can get to it quickly and, and help you out. That's what we're here for. Okay? All right, so you hit the finish button since I since I lost that uh, remote control. Mm -hmm. Doesn't All right, y'all. Have a great <laughs> night. Take care.